Good afternoon and happy Friday, everyone. Uh, we're pleased to have as our guest today the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, Lee Junhua, and the Administrator of the United Nations Development Program, Akam Steiner. And they'll be here to brief you on the launch of the Secretary General's Sustainable Development Goals Stimulus to deliver Agenda 2030 report. And so we'll hear from them uh, shortly. Uh, first, let's uh, go through our part. Today in Addis Ababa, the Secretary General took part in several high-level events. He addressed the roundtable on the Joint Sahel Assessment, the meeting of heads of state and government of the African Union Peace and Security Council on the situation in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, as well as the high-level committee on Libya. In his remarks to the meeting on Libya, the Secretary General said that the UN has no agenda and no goal but one, to secure the right of the Libyan people to live in peace, to vote in free and fair elections, and to share in the prosperity of their country. He warned that the absence of elections worsens economic insecurity, heightens political instability, risks renewed conflict, and raises the specter of partition. His remarks have been shared with you. The Secretary General had several bilateral meetings, including with the chairperson of the African Union Commission, Musa Faki Mohammed, the incoming chairperson of the African Union, the president of Comoros, uh, Azali Asumani, as well as the presidents of Burundi, Rwanda, South Africa, Kenya, and Namibia. And we've issued readouts following these meetings. Tomorrow, the Secretary General will deliver remarks at the 36th Ordinary Session of the African Union Assembly. In the afternoon, he will also speak to the press, and all of those remarks will be shared with you. The Secretary General is scheduled to be back in New York on Sunday. Turning to Syria and Turkey, we and our partners continue to scale up the cross-border aid operation from Turkey into northwest Syria. Today, 35 trucks from both the World Food Program and the International Organization for Migration cross Bab al Hawa crossing, carrying food and shelter and other items. Two trucks from the International Organization for Migration also crossed via Bab al Salam. In total, since the 9th of February, 178 trucks have gone into northwest Syria, 161 via Bab al Hawa, and 17 via Bab al Salam. In northwest Syria, according to recent assessments, 50,000 households need tents or emergency shelter, and at least 88,000 households need mattresses, thermal blankets, and clothing. In addition, our partners report that hospitals and medical centers are overstretched and under-resourced. Health partners are setting up temporary medical health facilities, deployment teams, and providing mental health and psychosocial support. More than 4,800 people, including people with disabilities, received medical consultations and health services in Idlib and Aleppo. More than 60,000 people in 74 collective centers were reached with water trucking since the start of the response. Our partners have set up reception centers and helped to provide tents and other items to camps in affected communities in Jindaris, Dana, Atareb, Maret Tamsrin, Harim, and Idlib. Some 13,000 people have received tents and 1,500 people have received heaters and fuel. In Syria, in addition to providing immediate food assistance in quake-affected cities, the World Food Program has resumed its regular general food assistance for 5.5 million people every month following a brief pause after the earthquakes. Between the 13th and 16th of February, 52 WFP contracted trucks crossed in, into northwest Syria through Bab al Hawa and Bab al Salam. WFP plans to use all three Turkish Syrian border crossings, Bab al Hawa, Bab al Salam, and Al Rai, to ensure a constant reach of aid to non government controlled areas of northwest Syria. For its part, the Food and Agriculture Organization is also scaling up operations in Turkey and Syria, focusing on the needs of rural communities. In Syria, rapid assessments by FAO of areas affected by the earthquakes suggest major disruption to crop and livestock production capacity, threatening immediate and longer-term food security. In Turkey, FAO is working closely with the government to determine the next steps in rehabilitating agriculture sector infrastructure, including irrigation systems, roads, markets, and storage capacity. Uh, and meanwhile, in Turkey, we continue to support the coordination of search and rescue operations. The teams are working in the provinces of Malatya, Karaman Marash, Adiaman, Gaziantep, and Hatay. We and our partners are delivering food, tents, blankets, and other supplies, with medical supplies and personnel being dispatched to affected areas. The UN Refugee Agency provided over 19,500 high thermal blankets, 
12,000 faux mattresses and 19,500 kitchen sets, 12,000 supplementary food packs, as well as heaters, hygiene items, and winter clothes. They also provided 14,300 family tents, 10,000 tarps, uh, 6,000 high thermal blankets, and close to 12,000 hygiene parcels. This morning, the Security Council held a meeting on threats to international peace and security. In his briefing, Assistant Secretary General Miroslav Yencha noted that long before the situation in Ukraine evolved into the present tragedy, the UN cautioned all relevant actors about the dangers of complacency regarding the implementation of the Minsk agreements and the risks of keeping the conflict unresolved. He pointed out that the UN has also used all opportunities, including before the Security Council, to urge all sides to avoid any unilateral steps that could deepen the divide or depart from the spirit and letter of the Minsk agreements. Mr. Yencha said that we have learned from the Minsk process that peace is not just about signing an agreement. He stressed that we need sustainable and implementable peace that addresses the root causes of the conflict and is in line with the UN Charter and international law. Mr. Yencha noted that the Secretary General has reiterated that the UN is ready to support all meaningful efforts to bring peace to Ukraine in line with the Charter and international law. His remarks have been shared with you. In the Central African Republic, our peacekeeping mission, MINUSCA, continues supporting the government to build peace and extend state authority, including through the rehabilitation of road infrastructure and community violence reduction. A bridge destroyed during armed groups' attacks in January 2021 was rebuilt with the mission support in Yakare, in Mbumo Prefecture. It enables safe transportation for the local population, rapid deployment of UN peacekeepers, and the delivery of humanitarian assistance. The mission also helped improve detention conditions at the Buar prison in Nana Mamberi Prefecture and trained 25 detainees in new skills to facilitate their socio-professional socio reintegration and offer them an alternative to recruitment by armed groups. The UN Refugee Agency and partners today said they are seeking $605 million to assist refugees from the Democratic Republic of the Congo across Africa this year. The regional response plan will support Congolese refugees who have found safety in neighboring countries across the southern and Great Lakes regions. It also aims to provide support to their local host communities. Uganda remains the largest host country of refugees from the DRC on the African continent. In 2022 alone, attacks by armed groups in eastern DRC led to the exile of some 98,000 refugees to Uganda, where a total of almost half a million Congolese refugees are now hosted. UNHCR and partners are calling on the international community to ensure continued support for these generous host countries so vulnerable refugee populations can be provided with protection, shelter, food, health, education, and other basic services. This year's regional response plan also seeks to promote economic self-reliance and resilience for refugees and vulnerable host communities. It will focus on youth and women-led initiatives to reduce dependence on assistance. The UN Refugee Agency today said that more than 60,000 Somalis, mainly women and children, have fled to Ethiopia's Somali region in the past few weeks to escape clashes and insecurity in the city of La Skanud in Sul region. UNHCR said that local communities in Duulu have generously welcomed the refugees, sharing whatever resources they have, but warns that these are quickly depleting, as an average of 1,000 people continue to cross into Ethiopia each day. In response to the sudden influx, UNHCR is working with the Ethiopian government's refugees and returnees services and regional authorities, together with the UN and NGO partners, setting up temporary reception centers and providing immediate life-saving aid. Relief items, including blankets, jerry cans, buckets, kitchen sets, plastic sheets, and mosquito nets, have all already been distributed to more than 1,000 vulnerable families, and UNHCR aims to reach another 9,000 families in the coming days. The UN Refugee Agency notes that inside Somalia, more than 185,000 people have been displaced from La Askanu town and its surrounding areas since early February. UNHCR is calling for all parties to respect the safety of civilians and for additional funding support to meet the needs of these newly displaced. In Malawi, our team, led by resident coordinator Rebecca Ada Donto, launched this week with authorities a campaign to fight the country's worst cholera outbreak on record, with over 1,400 deaths and 43,000 cases to date. Over the past four months, the UN Population Fund has delivered over 150 cholera beds, 14 tents for cholera treatment, and other essential supplies to health authorities. For its part, the World Food Program provided 12 mobile storage units for cholera treatment, while increasing safety in nearly 500 schools for over 600,000 students, providing soap, 
hand washing stations, and cholera information. World leaders announced today that over $826 million to education cannot wait, the UN Global Fund for Education in Emergencies and Protracted Crises, to support the education of millions of girls and boys living in crises. These announcements were made at the Education Cannot Wait High-Level Financing Conference in Geneva, Switzerland. Worldwide, 222 million children impacted by conflict, climate change, forced displacement, and other protracted crises urgently need quality education. Together with, with its partners, Education Cannot Wait is leading the way to reach them with the safety, hope, and opportunity that only holistic education can provide. Today, we mark Global Tourism Resilience Day, which aims to emphasize the need to foster resilient tourism development to deal with shocks, taking into account the vulnerability of the tourism sector to emergencies. It's also a call for action to, for member states to develop national strategies for rehabilitation after disruptions, including through private-public cooperation and the diversification of activities and products. And for the honor roll, we say thank you to our friends in Nauru in Italy for paying their 2023 regular budget dues in full. That brings the final tally for the honor roll this year to 53 member states. And soon you'll hear from Akim Steiner and Under Secretary General Lee. And on Monday, we will be joined by guests who will brief you on the plans and expected outcomes of the upcoming fifth UN conference on the least developed countries, taking place from the 5th to the 9th of March in Doha, Qatar. The guest will be Ms. Rabab Fatima, the UN High Representative for Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States. Ambassador Sheikha Alia Ahmed bin Saif Altani, the Permanent Representative of the State of Qatar to the United States. And Dr. Agnes Mary Chimbiri Molande, the Permanent Representative of the Republic of Malawi to the United Nations. And uh, so for, before we go to our guests, uh, do you have any questions for me? Yes, Ibtasam. Uh, Farhan, on the... Uh Monday, most probably the Security Council will uh, vote on a resolution on the issue of uh, settlements uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories. I know you it's you can you you wouldn't say something about uh, specifically the resolution or something uh, a next step. But my question is, do you believe does the Secretary General believe that? Uh, a resolution on uh, on the settlements and the illegality of the settlement would give a clear message to um, go ahead and uh, to hold the uh, um, UN uh, resolutions and positions? Well, first of all, just as a general rule, we always support unified, strong statements by the Security Council on uh, the the matters and threats that we deal with. Uh, on this, in this case, uh, concerning settlements, our position on settlements is clear that they are in contravention to international law and they're unhelpful to the peace process. Uh, and so we have uh, stood by that uh, position and, uh, and uh, uh, certainly we uh, welcome any uh, support that we get for that position. And uh, could you remind us why the, the, the quartet uh, is not uh, meeting? Well, the meetings of the quartet ultimately have to be agreed by the four uh, partners of that body. We are one partner, and we are certainly willing uh, to participate in meetings whenever uh, that is practicable. Uh, but ultimately, that has to be coordinated uh, with our partners uh, in the United States, the Russian Federation, and the European Union. And ultimately, uh, uh, we can only speak for one of those four parties. And, and did, did you initiate? Uh, did you initiate uh, such a, uh, a meeting? And you, who, who didn't agree to the meeting? Well, ultimately, uh, this is something that uh, our special coordinator on the ground, Tor Venisland, uh, discusses with uh, our partners in the quartet. When uh, we can come to an agreement, uh, we certainly uh, will be willing to to do so. Uh, yes, uh, Deji. Uh, just a quick question. Today, uh, hours ago, there is an explosion inside Karachi, a, poli a police station in Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, does the UN uh, follow this uh, situation, and what do does does the Secretary General has to say on this? Uh, well, first of all, we need to determine uh, precisely what happened uh, to to cause this explosion to come out, uh, to come about. But from our standpoint, of course, uh, uh, we are concerned uh, about this uh, and and we uh, 
send our our hopes uh, f for uh, any quick recovery by those who have been injured uh, by this explosion, and uh, and uh, we certainly hope uh, that uh, that. Uh, emergency services and uh, and uh, will be provided to all those who need it. Uh, Stefano? Thank you, Farhan. Um, yesterday, the, um, Volker Turk um, from the Human Rights, he criticized the, he criticized the, the um, a new law that passed in one chamber of the Italian parliament about how the how the ONG, the rescuing um, migrants, should act. You know, I'm not going to say all the things that have been criticized, but basically, Turk says that this will cause more death, and uh, apparently, looks like he's not respecting all the international law. Today, um, Secretary General intervened on the on a High Commission of the um, African Union about Libya, and in speech, he he just say that he say um, um, I retire my call for all countries involved to respect the integrity of international refugee law and for Libyan authority to find right based alternative to detention in line with international human rights law. Uh, yes. So the question is, uh, he didn't specify about what Turk had said yesterday. Um, does the Secretary General think that this law that already passed one chamber, next week will pass the Senate, I mean, we believe it could pass the Senate, does he think if, uh, this law will, uh, uh, will respect international law or not? Well, uh, first of all, we're not going to comment on laws that as they proceed through legislative bodies. Obviously, that is part of the internal discussions within a state. Um, but uh, but the concerns that were expressed by uh, Volker Turk uh, speak for the system, and so those are our concerns. Well, but I'm sorry, a quick Volker Turk commented, and he said that the, actually he specified say the Italian government should uh, should not uh, try to push this law. It should 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 take it back. So, does the Secretary General agree with him or not? Well, on on the question of laws as they pass through legislative bodies, we will let the legislative bodies decide on their own procedures. But like I said, the concerns expressed by uh, Mr. Turk are the concerns of the system and are shared by the Secretary General. Uh, Maggie? Hey, Farhan. Um, hey. The US, <clears throat> sorry, the US House uh, Foreign Affairs Chairman, Michael McCall, sent a letter to the Secretary General on Thursday regarding the problems at the UN Office for Project Services. And uh, he says in that letter, in order to ensure the failures are not repeated, it's imperative the United States has access to the results of the UN's internal investigation. And he, <clears throat> sorry, he specifically says the results of the UN investigation were withheld from the US mission. So I'm wondering, have you received the letter has the UN refused to share the results of the investigation with the US mission? And indeed, in the interest of transparency, why aren't they being shared with the entire membership? Uh, well, I wouldn't have any comment about internal investigations, which are by definition internal. I'll, I'll check to see whether we've received the letter from uh, Mr. McCall, and and if so, what response we have to that. Uh, I am aware that uh, that uh, the UN Office for Project Services is, uh, you know, is involved in part of this process of determining uh, what the problems were and in fixing them. And beyond that, I'd refer you to UNOPS uh, regarding their response. But, uh, but uh, yes, I'll check up on whether the letter uh, from Mr. McCall has been received. But yeah. will you release the report? I mean, $60 million were was mishandled. And essentially, that's money that belongs to member states that they contributed to the budget and such. So wouldn't they be entitled to know where their $60 million went? All member states. Um, I believe the first, uh, if we've received the letter, it, it'll be studied and evaluated, and we'll see what the response will be. Yes, Deji. I have an organizational question. Uh, obviously, we're, we're here every day. You most likely you're here every day, but for UN staff, what's the rule for them to attend 
uh, to the HQ for work. Uh, you mean as a result uh, of yeah. the COVID times? Yeah. Uh, most staff are, in fact, encouraged to be back in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, for Depending on offices, managers have the authority to ask for people at this stage to be here at work three days a week and to have the option to work from home up to two days a week. Does the U.S. have any plan to change that back to pre-COVID uh, policy? Uh, that's the plan for right now. Uh, obviously, we'll continue to make adjustments as, as the case goes uh, on. However, of course, I would like to point out that COVID-19 as a pandemic is not vanished. There are still problems there. Uh, I was not here uh, for about a week last month because I had COVID. And so um, that's just what, something we have to adjust to. Yes. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, I just want to uh, get an explanation about the, the appeal that the Secretary General announced for Syria's earthquake uh, zones, uh, $397 million for a period of three months. In terms of the distribution, are all those aids that uh, going to be cross-border? Just, just want to make sure of that, or anything going to be cross-line going to Damascus? Is that... Uh, we are working uh, with the relevant authorities on the ground, both the Syrian government and the de facto authorities, mm -hmm. to see what we can achieve by way of cross-line assistance. Uh, we've okay. had some issues getting in. So right now, we're dealing uh, with cross-border aid, but, uh, but uh, we have not given up on uh, trying to get cross-line aid. So, yeah, so cross-line basically is still uh, on the table. It could be... It's, yeah, it's okay. on the table. Uh, ultimately, we need cooperation from all the various authorities on the ground to, to, to be able to use uh, the cross-line uh, uh, avenues mm -hmm. uh, to, to get aid in. Thank you. And with that, let me get to our guests.